<laughs> I'm offended. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 So I think we're not going to have a thesis on uh, intermediate wheatgrass managed as a dual use system and went really well. For those that don't know who you are, yeah. I'm James Bowden. Um, um, started in 2020 and I'll get out of here. So. Who were your <laughs> <fine> advisors? Uh, <laughs> Jessica Good Connect and uh, Dr. Jacob Youngers, who's online. And Melissa Wilson was my other committee member. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so um, I think it's we can get going. We've already got some announcements going. I just wanted to welcome everybody back and I'll get your photos up in oh, a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can do it for sure. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody back. It's a new year. We've got an exciting schedule coming up. Jake was just asking me about the upcoming meetings um, and we've shifting a few folks around to fit in more people and, and deal with some um, you know, scheduling stuff. And so we'll just send out a new updated schedule for the spring in the next week or so. So just, just some minor changes. Um, I also wanted to point out this new welcome slide. Um, and that's something that we are gonna ask all of our presenters to include at the front of their presentation for a couple of reasons. We want to welcome everybody. Uh, we have new people joining these meetings from time to time. Um, want to orient them to this is the Forever Green Initiative. Uh, it's an update. It's also a discussion. Um, and also to highlight um, the bottom part of the slide of, you know, Forever Green as a group, as a community is trying to be as welcoming and inclusive as we can be. Um, and that is a long-term journey. It is not a one, well, one and done type thing. And we are not gonna be perfect as a group, but we want to, first of all, make it clear that we're trying um, and then all help each other to make progress on that. Um, one thing that we can do uh, that I actually need to check if I'm doing it right now, so I will, um, is to make sure we share our pronouns. So we're clear about that. We all know what personal pronouns people prefer to be used and referred to by. Um, so, you know, if you're on Zoom, you can add them to your Zoom name. If you're speaking, you can share them. And we're also, and uh, this group today has agreed to, to start, kick this off, just asking speakers to add those pronouns to their slides. Usually on the title slide, right, you've got a, a bunch of names. So it's a good opportunity to highlight that. Um, and we were hoping that this is kind of, again, kicking off uh, a journey and there'll be more steps along the way or points along the way where we we do more to learn about how to be inclusive and we implement that. And so any thoughts, any feedback about all of that, I think is very welcome. Um, anything that people want to share right now before we move on to the next updates? Um, if not, I'm going to steal the screen for a second because David wanted to share a couple photos. Um, which one should I start with, David? The... I can start seeing them. Okay. And it's not showing up there, but it is being shared, David, so you can go ahead. There you go. Uh, okay, this is just a, a brief update. Um, we don't really talk about cooking so much as more pans for me. Uh, but this is something that I've been interested in from the get-go with the penny crust is, is making it into an oil that's suitable for food use. The original oil started off with a high um, amount of fatty acid and uh, uric acid, which is toxic. And with the genetics, we've been able to get rid of that and make a oil that's high oleic that's very similar to uh, canola oil. In fact, I think this will give canola oil a run for its money. And just to uh, highlight that, uh, the next slide shows uh, that it does a very nice job of uh, cooking chicken. Which you're going to serve in a few minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to serve to us in a few minutes. Well, Frank is going to bring back some oil that uh, he's already. Uh, no, no, you have to chuck a lot of the oil. <laughs> <laughs> There's the oil. 
And so I, I'm the first guinea pig on this. So this is uh, for historic purposes. It was the first fried chicken ever made with penny press oil. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and Jeff will be uh, following up uh, on my footsteps. Uh, we'll see what he can do with it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. It's probably my wife, Jessica, who will be pretty close to that. But I'll, I'll, I'll be sampling. I'll be the guinea pig who samples. Are you feeling OK? Uh, so far, right. my wife is, is, is okay, okay. Here, so, so we're for fun. All right. Thanks. Now to Praveen. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think you can just steal the share, but I'll, I'll stop sharing in case you can. Great. All right. I hope everyone can hear me online. Um, Today, I will be sharing with you um, our research update on breeding and improving perennial cereals. Until last year, it was only Kernza, um, and Kernza is still the, the bulk of it, but it's expanded to a couple of more crops, perennial rye and possibly perennial oats. Um, I'll share a brief update on those two species, but for the majority, it will be Kernza, as it has always been. The, the rough outline for today's talk is uh, we'll start with breeding update on cycle five that was finished last fall. Cycle six was initiated last fall as well. Um, then we'll talk about variety candidates, uh, how the performance is going and what's ahead in terms of um, uh, release and, and, and the progress there as well. And then Hannah Stoll will be talking about her PhD project in wheatgrass. And after that, we'll talk very briefly on perennial cereal rye and perennial oats and what we're doing with those two species. So wheatgrass is a perennial relative of wheat. I, I keep this slide so any new people um, in the meeting can, um, they, they know what this crop is. It's mostly near immune to mostly resistant to a lot of cereal diseases uh, and has extremely impressive winter hardiness. Um, there's a breeding program up in Canada and uh, the amount of winter kill we've seen in Minnesota and in Canada is fairly low. Uh, it's a allohexaploid, meaning <clears throat> um, there's three parents donating um, a set each of, of the genomes. Uh, you'll see that the JSV and um, the ST, JVS, and JR that I'm getting, I'm waiting to get clarification on from uh, Kevin Dorn, who's been leading the sequencing project. But the progenitor species, three of those you can see on the panels in the, in the right. And the genome size is fairly large, slightly smaller than that of wheat at about 12 gigabase pairs. It's a near obligate outcrosser. Um, it can self, but it's, um, the, the seed production is pretty much non-existent. And because of the obligate outcrossing nature, um, it's a very highly heterozygous uh, species. And, in theory, every seed is heterogeneous, meaning that genetically they are not the same. They're going to be very different. There's a quick look at timeline of wheatgrass domestication. Uh, it started as a forage crop in uh, 1930s in North America. It was introduced, I believe, from um, Eastern Europe, Russian um, region. And then in the 80s, the Rodel Institute selected intermediate wheatgrass out of about 100 perennial species to be the best candidate for domestication based on certain attributes like seed size, plant height, biomass, uh, usage in food, and so on. And they evaluated about 250 accessions of wheatgrass at that time, um, carried out two rounds of selection. The material was passed on to USDA in New York, and the Land Institute inherited all of that in uh, the early 2000s to start their breeding program, which continues to this day. We obtained our materials in 2011 fall, uh, about 2,600 seedlings from the Land Institute's third breeding cycle. I think they are now up to 11, maybe even 12. Um, I have to ask Lee. Um, we are at six. Um, and up until last year, we had been doing one breeding cycle. Uh, and that, that spanned two years and starting 2023 this year, um, we're moving on with one cycle a year kind of scheme. And in the past decade or so, we have released uh, the first food grade Kernza variety with uh, another one 
soon to be released as well. And I, I'll talk about that more later. So what are our breeding goals? Just like any other crop breeding program, um, we want higher grain yield. Um, and, and on top of that, we want sustained or persistent grain yield where the grain yield does not decline in multiple cropping years or seasons. Right now, um, at least in Minnesota and, and, and the upper Midwest, uh, year three onwards, the production dips quite dramatically. Um, and we're, we're trying to um, improve this uh, breeders, uh, physiologists, agronomists, we're all working together to see how we can improve that. Uh, of course, we want larger seeds. Uh, currently, the seed size is about a third or fourth of wheat in terms of how wide it is. Length is longer than wheat or eye barley. Uh, not always, but mostly. But it's pretty thin looking seed, which means small and this firm, less flower. We are improving shattering uh, in the field. We do not want the seeds to, to drop in the field when uh, there's rain or wind, or even the combine goes through it uh, while harvesting. Uh, we want free threshing, which means the percent of, of, of dehog or naked grain coming out of the combine or uh, lab thresher, for example. Um, also making quite a, a good progress in that trade. Um, we evaluate spike traits, such as spike length, weight, spike length density, um, no strong selection on that, but I do evaluate um, these traits and, and this, these are considered while making selections. Height is positively significantly correlated with grain yield and seed size. Uh, so uh, dwarf wheatgrass might not be possible right now, but that's not to say it's not going to be possible in the future. But right now I say optimal plant height so that the yield does not take a hit and while the plant is not too tall. Um, and on a similar note, lodging resistance, if the plant is too tall and the stem is not strong enough, when a, a wind comes through or a rainstorm comes through, the plant might, might lodge, like fall in the field. Um, so we're selecting against that. I keep track of what diseases I see in the field, mainly scab, fusarium head blight, um, and ergot, anything I see. So I, I uh, evaluate these traits on a um, presence absence manner. So if I see a, a good amount of disease, then it's a, it's, a, it's a one and that gets kicked out, so selected against. And finally, end use quality and, and food products, the, all the, the, the grain that we uh, develop in our varieties and candidate varieties, we, we give that to our colleagues in the food science department, Dr. Ismail and Dr. Anor, and they, they look at chemical composition, storage, uh, stability, um, and other, other aspects, uh, the nutritional aspects of the grain. And we work on all these traits at the same time, of course. They are all considered at the same time, so a lot of traits that, that we improve every cycle. So I want to um, talk about cycle five, which was just completed this past fall. We had about 550 genotypes that were planted in space plant design. You can see the figure on top right, that's from St. Paul. Um, and that's year two plants, I think. Um, we had another site, a replica of this in Lamberton as well. They were evaluated for two years, 21 and 22. Um, the traits measure, we, I already mentioned, um, but here I provide uh, the rough timeline on when they're measured. So for example, spring growth vigor is early May, first week of, you know, by 10th May, um, I, I note that. Heading as they emerge, um, spike length, number of spikelets and, um, and plant height is done about a week or so before they're harvested in mid to late July. Uh, plant health and, and diseases also in, in July, early to mid July. Um, shatter resistance, spike weight is done post harvest, but before threshing. And threshability meaning percentage dehulled grain and ergot, because it also gets threshed and easy to see the ergot kernels. It happens during threshing. And on that one, I have been um, evaluating those two traits myself, but from last year, we have, uh, we're trying to move on to a camera-based system where we take images and, and, and do that digitally so that we get consistent data um, year in, year out. Um, and then yield and seed dimensions um, and, and seed weight are done after the crushing. Um, the seed dimensions and, and weight are done using uh, a machine called Marvin. So here's a, a look at a trait improvement uh, progress trend line, if you will. Um, on the top left 
is shattering. We did not have data on cycle one for shattering. Um, so overall, if you look from cycle two to cycle five, there's uh, in general a, a decreased trend and I, I provide the average values um, in a couple of slides. On the top right, we have seed size um, or a thousand kernel weight. Um, that's this is the slowest progress in terms of uh, trade development compared to other trades. It's a little slow. We've been um, we've been improving, but it's it's more challenging than the others. Bottom left is pre threshing or threshability. Um, that's the trade that where we have had the most success. Um, and on the bottom right, we have plant height where it's kind of up and down, but overall it's also decreasing as it is seen the size the line. trait historically in breeding programs that has been most resilient to increasing. It's it's tough. It's a complex trait with multiple genes involved and um, you know people have tried uh, doing mutation populations crossing with other species yet it's it's been the toughest. So it's a resilient trait. Yes. <clears throat> and here's grain yield um, where, well, overall, the trend looks like we are decreasing grain yield, and that's why I have more explanation included in this in this figure. So if you look at cycle one and cycle two, the grain yield um, dipped from cycle one to two and, and two to three, but cycle three is where I, I took over the breeding program and we introduced, um, along with um, the help from um, um, Brett, who, is, uh, who oversees wheatgrass and, and pennycress uh, field design and, um, and, and the seed house operations. We've implemented a standard method where we drive for three days. We use this indoor lab pressure, the Winter Steiger LV350. We aspirate as much shaft as possible and then wait. In cycle one and two, I do not think, think those, those methodologies existed. And that's why, while there's a dramatic drop from one to two and two to three, from three, on, three to four to five, there's a consistent increase in yield. Um, and if, if we had similar uh, capacity in cycles one and two, I actually think that, that I, don't, I don't think we would have seen that dip, but I, it's hard to say what was exactly was done. But nonetheless, we're, we're trending in the positive direction for green yield. That's what I want to clarify. For me, for yes. So is this the average over the 550 or however many do you have? Yes, this is the space plants. Um, on the varieties, we have varieties that have originated from cycles one and two so far. The ones that I selected from cycle three, they entered in trials just last fall. It, it just takes a while. So cycle one, two, and three data, we should have next fall. So by the time I present again next year, we should have a three-year trend line at least. And I was also wondering if maybe there are archived samples for cycle one and two to be re aspirated and that sort of thing. Like it would be very interesting to see. Yeah. That <laughs> I, yeah, we thought about that. We, unfortunately, we, we got rid of most of the, um, the harvest material because of space issues. Um, so, and all of the data that I've shown, you know, throughout the years, they come from different environments, different locations. Um, so the, there's definitely an uh, environmental effect to this data that you're seeing, and that's exactly where Hannah's project is is um, is going to come to play as um, she's she's doing well. She'll explain more later, but um, Hannah's project will give us more uh, a clearer picture of okay. the projects. Yeah, we'll play. Sorry, no, it's okay. Um, how long is the cycle? Is it the first year of production of the crop, or is it are the stands aging over time? So each cycle, cycle one through five, is two years in the field, uh, and one data point is an average of two years, two locations. Okay. Except, well, cycle one and cycle two were just two years, um, one location in St. Paul, and cycle three we expanded with the second site. Yes, in yes. the yield increase, where does um, where does Clearwater fall on this? That's like Mitch was asking. Yeah. Uh, that falls on a, a variety development. It's a, a, a different segment of the breeding program. All the data I'm, okay. I've shown so far, it, it comes from space plants. Oh, so it's okay. I didn't make that connection on Mitch. But it, this question. Okay. In, you know, in an attempt to answer your question, uh, cycle one uh, genotypes were used to create them in the water. So that very first uh, dot um, on the left would be uh, the parents of MN clear water would be somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. So somewhere in that yield, and then 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, the the plot on the right shows um, across the cycle yield increase, starting with cycle three, um, to again show that you know the, the increase in yield is, is happening. Kind of see that. Um, and one interesting uh, pattern you'll notice is that um, I probably should have done Y one year one year two, but um, the bar year one yields are less than year two yields for space plants, and um, that's that's a trend across all locations and all cycles. And for example, near the very end, the, the green bars, LAM twenty one is year one of cycle five in Lamberton, and the yield is less than the second year, which is LAM twenty two. And same for St. Paul 21 and 22. So in, in space plants, we see a higher yield in year two, whereas in variety trials, year two yield goes down about just a little, little bit. And year three is more significant top off. Oops. Um, so here's a summary of, of all those all those plots. Um, shattering on the very left is on average, we're making progress of 15%, that minus sign is a good sign. It means we're reducing shattering in the field. So across cycles, roughly 15% uh, improvement per cycle. Uh, Pre-threshing is about 25%. That we want to be in the positive direction, so that's good. Seed size, as I said, about just 1.2% per cycle. Um, it's the, the drought the past couple of years has affected the data for seed size, but uh, nonetheless, it's kind of good to see that we're Positive, but that's that's not good enough. I'm like myself. I'm not too pleased with that number. Plant height is in the negative direction, um, kind of small as well. Um, grain yield again. If you look at all cycles, it's negative seven point six. But if you look at cycle three onwards, about fourteen percent increase per year. Excuse me, per cycle in terms of grain yield. Um, that said, uh, cycle six is underway. This is plot in Lamberton, the freshly transplanted seedlings and just uh, watered a little bit. As you can see those dark spots. We have a little under 1,000 space plants here in Lamberton and slightly more in St. Paul. Um, and one particular project I want to discuss about on the cycle six population is this Rhizotron uh, study where you can see within the yellow circles is um, um, glass tubes, plexiglass tubes. There's 150 of those in St. Paul. So if we're doing only one, one location because of uh, how labor intensive this work is. Um, the big picture goal of installing, well, the rhizotrons are hollow glass tubes through which we'll pass camera tubes to take pictures two to four times a season to assess how the root is growing next to its 150 plants. With a big picture goal of uh, uh, understanding, um, is breeding changing any of these root uh, properties? And uh, what's the potential of using the root data obtained from the population to select individuals to be used towards development of uh, varieties that will continue to provide these excellent ecosystem services that we talk about? Um, so from the 150 plants, um, we will take data such as um, root number, length diameters, and area densities using machine learning models that Dr. Jake Younger's uh, grad student, um, Alex Griffin, is uh, developing. And we will uh, study the relationship between underground data and above ground data um, and, and, and ask a few, few questions that, that Jake and I are, are considering. Um, with the end goal again of being uh, that we will be selecting individuals that have good above ground traits and good below ground traits. Um, we'll start collecting data um, in maybe April or May of 2023. And uh, we'll, we'll, we hope to do this for at least two years. It would be nice to go on the third year, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So now that's that's all of these space plants. Um, Let me ask you, who's yes. funding that? Who's funding that part of the work? That root study is being funded uh, by uh, the Clean Water Council, I, I believe. So it's a very important project uh, to uh, inform not just the policymakers but also farmers, researchers, and um, we, we we will for the first time um, evaluate what's happening under the soil in a wheatgrass breeding yeah. population. The implications are huge. You know, we can select. Plants with no shattering, large seed, at the same time, large uh, root system, 
expansive root system and so on. So it's a very exciting project. We have no idea what we find, but we're very excited. So on the variety candidates, we have developed 35 so far, and there's a breakdown by cycle. Um, as Jess was asking, the five from cycle one, in and water was one of the fives. Um, we planted eight from cycle five uh, last fall, and cycle six this fall, we will plant 10 to 12, and the same number will happen every year. So in, in a matter of just a couple of years, we will uh, almost double the number of variety candidates we'll have. And um, the more we have, you know, the better chance of selecting the absolute best. So uh, quite excited about this aspect as well. Um, MN1603, which was obtained from cycle two uh, population is currently, I don't know what happened to the font there, I'm sorry, but it's in a large scale increase with the one farmer participation in um, Southwest Minnesota. Um, and I'm gonna show yield data relative to MN clear water, which is in 100, the green bar you can see. Um, and this is two year yield performance data. We had data in 2021 from Lamberton, St. Paul and Rozo. For this year, um, or 2022, I have data from Lamberton and St. Paul. Um, I'm waiting for data from Rozo um, on that, but you can see that MN1607 is the best across two years, the first one. Um, and that's a little unfortunate because it had a very poor stance when we were trying to do a small seed increase. It had maybe less than 40% pre-threshing. So that was, that was discarded right away, but because we had seed, it entered in trials and at least for pure yield, it's, it's, um, it's doing pretty well. However, the next bar, the orange one is <clears throat> MN1603, um, and right next to that in gray is TLI701. Um, and then if we look at year one data, so on, on across two years and five sites, uh, MN1603 has about 6% advantage to MN clear water. Um, but if you look at just one year data, which was from just last uh, or, or 2021, uh, MN1603, which is in blue, the very uh, the bar in the very front, had about 11% yield advantage to MN clear water. Um, in year two, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, the variety trials, the yield plots, the yield tends to go down. And in year three, the, the numbers are probably going to go down even uh, further. We, we're keeping all the trials uh, in place for one additional year in 2023, and then we'll reevaluate what variety we can uh, we can release. Here's a look at seed size, and this is two year average. Uh, the the column on the very right shows the seed size uh, compared to MN clear water. <clears throat> MN603 has about six percent larger seed. Uh, compared to MN clear water across two years um, and across uh, just one year, I think it was about 8%. So um, it's pre pretty good compared to MN clear water. Um, and it, it does have higher threshability about, I'd say somewhere in the 70% range. So given that data, uh, and of course, after waiting for one more data in 2023, um, this, this coming summer, um, MN1603 might, could be the next variety. But then last year we um, looked at MN19 candidates that came from small increases in Rosemount. Um, and if you just look at that, the first thing that pops out is uh, the percent of D hauled or naked grain in each of these trays. The one on the very top left is 1902. I, I, I probably rated at about 95% pre threshing, at least 90% or higher. So that's a significant advantage to MN1603. We do not have yield data on this, so we cannot make direct comparison yet, but they are, they were planted together last fall. So we'll get the first set of data this summer or this fall and see if it's worth releasing MN603 or better wait another two years and, and go with something that has much higher cleanup rate than, than MN603. How does that compare to Lee's best um, farms? 
I do not have data on that, so I cannot speak to that. But he also has really it's great online. materials. Yeah, what I've seen online. online. Yeah. Lee, are you online? <clears throat> yeah, I'm here, Don. What percent free thrashing do you have in your material? Yeah, there's some that are similar to those. Yep. Definitely. The, the TLI uh, entries on the previous slide were probably, some of them were probably pretty good. We can fix that. Um, you go to uh, There's two years that she's in twice. Yeah, okay. All right, try again, Lee. No, oh, can you hear me? Can you hear us? <laughs> can you hear us, Lee? I'll unmute. Lee, Lee can, can you hear us? us? Lee, can you hear 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 us? <laughs> I withdraw my question. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not worth it. it. Not worth it. Not worth it. What about now? Can anyone hear us? Yes, I can hear you. George can hear us. Yep. Uh, Lee, can you try speaking? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Hey, great. Yes, we also have high pre threshing in our program here. Um, some of those TLI lines in the previous slide were probably uh, around 85, 90%. At least they are when I, when I grow them. Yeah. I don't know how they came out for, but yeah, maybe you know, like 704. Should have been pretty high pre threshing. It's about 90% okay. here. So that seems to be about it 90 95% pre threshing in uh, the lines that are being advanced. Right, right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Individual plants are 99 to 100%. Uh, space yeah. plants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I will ask no more questions. <laughs> so, since I'm talking, I'll ask a provident yeah. question. Are you guys all worried about selection for higher yield per space plant, just selecting for greater rhizome spread or tillering um, bigger plants instead of higher yield per space? That's a, that's a great point, Lee. I'm gonna show um, how I selected uh, two of the eight new candidate varieties in a slide or two. Um, I, I think I, I wanted to tackle yield decline versus yield. Um, or total yield, um, and I don't know if it's going to work, but I, I'd love to hear input in a slide or two, just in a second. Good. Okay. Um, one, one, another point on this slide is that the grain that you're seeing on the pictures, uh, they're not dehauled. We, we have a dehauler on campus, but we don't have the capacity to run it. We could run it, but we don't run it. Um, the grain was obtained from a combine and just clean using that vertical shaker with seeds. So no dehulling done whatsoever. So this is to show that the genetic improvement in um, selecting for the traits, combining the parents with these traits is indeed working. Um, I'm surprised to no one. Uh, here are the MN19 candidates, maybe a little difficult to see for those online or also in your room, but uh, the MN1902 you saw as being the best um, was um, selected for large seed size and high threshability. It's in the middle right. Um, after that was 1904, that was selected for high yield and near 100% threshability. So it's, it's, it's online with, with what we've, um, we've seen in the pictures. And as I mentioned, they're all in variety trials They entered last fall and we'll, we'll see uh, the data next year or this year. And I do have plans to at more sites, hopefully with help from um, Dr. Jake Youngers this fall. 
this is one example of a crossing block uh, where there are parents that are X number of parents replicated X number of times. Uh, the, the number has varied in the past and present, but in this particular plot, there are 10 different genotypes that were the best in cycle four, and they were cloned X number of times, and they're randomized, and they cross with dry all around them, so the pollen does not travel to another crossing block that's adjacent about 50 feet next to this. Um, just wanted to show how we do this in the field. So we established eight crossing blocks last fall. Um, six were regular, um, and two that are highlighted in blue are, they were selected a little differently where I picked the parents based on um, their excellent trait performance for other traits except growth vigor. So they were not as vigorous. They were not as bushy, uh, fairly tall, but not, not, they did not spread as, as, as well as, as others did. Um, and, oh, sorry, um, on, the, on the very right, you can see the, the traits I picked these for, the parents of these two blocks, near 100% threshing, near 0% shatter, good seed size, but less vigor. And the idea was, uh, because we we're seeing this yield decline where uh, one of the idea is, you know, the, the plants are just competing against each other too much, uh, is selecting for less vigorous parents going to uh, create a population um, that consists of progeny that are not as vigorous um, compared to what we've done in the past. So those would have lower space plant yields. These will have lower space plant yields, yes. But um, is it better to have? I don't know. I don't know the answer. But in my head, I thought maybe if the year to year, year one, two, three yield is more consistent, or the drop off is not as severe, maybe that's a trade off to have. Then highest year one or year two yields. Um, is this going to work? I don't know. Um, so Lee, to, to your question, th th this was my one approach where I, you know, I established two blocks. Uh, I don't know if you've done something similar, but I, I'd hear to hear, love to hear your input. Uh, yeah, if you're asking me, um, definitely. I, I've not selected on whole plant yield because of that. Uh, so I've probably seen a decline in yield per plant, just like you saw happening in the early generations. Um, on my side, that was pretty much intentional. I was trying to make them not uh, bigger and bigger. They were trying to be a little smaller plants. Um, it has resulted in maybe a little under bigger. So now I'm going to try to select for a few more uh, tillers per plant again. Uh, it seems like we went a little too far, but uh, yeah, my focus is, has been to avoid that uh, bigger plant breeding problem that has been a problem with uh, perennial grass breeding for a long time. Yeah, if, if I had to quantify the vigor on, on the parents for these two crossing blocks, it's maybe about a third of, of the other plants. So not, not too crazy low. Um, but obviously not, not as robust as the other plants either. So a third reduction and bigger, a third. Yeah, uh, mainly in expansion. Yeah. Um, but the plant themselves are healthy. They produce, you know, good side seed and, and all the other traits are fine. Just in terms of how much they expand and how many tillers there are, they're a little less curious. Lee, you said it's under vigor from the perspective of you're not getting enough tillers to produce the yield, or is it like a weed competition or some <clears throat> factor that you're worried about? Yeah, weed competition would be one. Another would be uh, we had a really severe winter drought here last season, uh, essentially no rainfall for six months, uh, and actually had plants die over the winter for the first time, really. And it was mostly these newer plants that were not as, as vigorous. And tillering. Uh, so I think there's an issue with that. Also, yeah, I've thought that, yeah, selecting, as, as you were saying, Robin, for fewer heads um, might uh, be good in keeping them from crowding and shutting themselves out. But the downside of that might be that those which are making a lot of heads are doing so even though they're crowded. And um, if you select for fewer heads, they more easily lose all their heads when they get crowded. Uh, so it's still up in the air uh, as to what, what the best way to go is, I think.
ultimately, my idea though is to go away from this base plant selection to entirely uh, genomic selection based on yield of half sieve families in solid seeded plots. So uh, try to stop guessing and try to use more real data from solid planted plots over many years. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I am not going to discuss half sips as much just because there's too many things, but yeah, I'm, I'm planning on putting 500, 600 half sips. And, and I don't think I'll save the mother plants, but at least use the genetic data and, and see and project the future populations based on that. Um, anyway, uh, the remaining six out of the eight crossing blocks were selected for the traits you can see 100% um, pre threshing. Largest thousand kernel weight. Um, you know, some have zero percent shatter, hundred percent free threshing. Near largest thousand kernel weight or the seed size, um, and, and so on. So, uh, most uh, most focus has been on increasing um, free threshing, reducing seed shatter, and improving seed size. And um, I'm excited to see what happens in another two years uh, with your crossing blocks. So with that, I'm going to stop for a second and let Hannah present her project, and we'll, we'll come back to a uh, perennial cereal rye. So, Hannah, you want to? Do you want me to come to you? Think I did. Did you get the slides open? If you're on Zoom, you could also share. I know, but I could, yeah. It's another. Other avenue. It's downloaded, but whatever is easy. You work on yours, and I'll work on my solution. And we're not sure whichever one is faster. We'll go with. And I'll put my pronouns in my name while we're doing it. <laughs> Practice what I'm preaching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Hannah Stahl. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my a sliver of my PhD research, which is assessing genetic gain in our breeding program here at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> there we go. So I'll start off by talking a little bit about uh, my experimental design and how I've been phenotyping some of these traits. Um, and then the second thing I'll talk about that I'll focus most on is genetic gain, specifically of shattering. And if we have time, which I think I'm lo looking at how time is going right now, I'm probably going to skip over my additional projects that I might briefly mention. We've got the end. Uh, to uh, one bird. Okay. Have time. Okay. Well, he has more, more to present for this, too. Well, I understand what I'm just saying. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so my experimental design. Um, so I have what some people could think of as a common garden, but basically I have the parents that are cloned uh, from our breeding program of cycle two, three, four, and five growing in the same environment. So earlier, Prabin was talking about progress that he saw from you know cycle one through five in our breeding program. Um, however, the important consideration with that is that you're not comparing plants that were actually grown in the same environment whenever you're comparing cycles, um, which is where my experiment, experiment kind of comes in uh, to the equation. So my experiment is more or less like a ground truthing of the actual progress that we're seeing in our breeding program at the University of Minnesota. So this experiment was grown at two locations, Lamberton, Minnesota and St. Paul, Minnesota. It was established in 2020, and I collected data in both 2021 and 2022. It's an augmented design, which basically just means that um, each individual parent genet was not replicated. However, I did have replicated checks in my experiment, um, and I'm using those to adjust for spatial variation um, using AS Rimmel. Okay, phenotyping. The slide looks kind of similar to what Prabeen uh, presented on earlier, and that's because I'm phenotyping basically the same traits that 
Carbena has been phenotyping and selecting for in our breeding program. So pre-harvest traits like vigor, heading, and thesis, height, and lodging, I took notes on. And then post-harvest traits like spike characteristics. So the number of florets on a spike, the length of that spike, um, to get an idea of the density of florets on a spike. Um, grain yield, so both in a 10 spike sample and a whole plant sample. Again, these are space plants, as you saw in my picture earlier. Um, seed size, threshability, shattering, and pre-harvest sprouting. And the last three, threshability, shattering, and pre-harvest sprouting are what I will be giving you the most details on today. So pre-harvest sprouting, um, there's not really a whole lot known. By not a whole lot, I mean, I don't know really, there's no publications out there that cover pre-harvest sprouting in intermediate wheat grafts, but we do know a lot about pre-harvest sprouting in wheat. Um, so a lot of current literature characterizes PHS in wheat and barley, um, but we don't know much about pre-harvest sprouting in wheat grafts. Um, so my goal was to get an idea of what might be going on. Um, and so I used my existing population, so that parent population with cycle two through five in the same experiment. Um, and I subsampled some of those uh, genotypes and did a pilot study on what pre-harvest sprouting looks like in wheatgrass. Um, a few key differences in wheat, typically you would leave uh, the spikes that you harvest in a dew chamber to induce sprouting for about a week at least. Um, and wheatgrass, the first, the first trial I ran, I left in there for a week and it was way too long. Everything was sprouting and there was not really any differences that I could see um, among genotypes. But whenever I shortened the amount of time that I left the spikes in the dew chamber, um, like four to five days is probably optimal. And that's whenever I started seeing that pre-harvest sprouting trait. Um, I rated it on a zero to nine scale, similar to how we do for wheat. Um, and in summary, there's genotypic variation in my assessment. Um, so this is something that uh, is probably worth looking out for in future breeding efforts and uh, future screening. Another trait that I looked at was threshability. I did a visual rating of seeds, um, zero being 0% 0 free threshing or all hold, nine being basically 90 to 100% free threshing or naked seeds. Um, so I did a visual rating and I've also been working with Lita Han at the Land Institute to, um, to work on an image analysis pipeline. So a way to kind of automate this process and get a better estimate of hold seeds, de-hold seeds, and ergot and chaff in your samples. And in summary, um, this software, Elastic, works really well. Um, I'm not gonna go into any details, but if anybody wants to um, meet with me on that or follow up, I'm happy to chat more. Okay, and this is the kind of the focus of quantifying genetic gain and the main, um, the main point for my talk today, which is shattering. So I'll start off by describing, there's two types of, two primary types of shattering in wheatgrass. There's floret shattering, and brittle rachis shattering. Um, I phenotypes both of these independently because they're, they're independently genetically controlled. So it's thought that floret shattering has a more complex genetic control and brittle rachis shattering has fewer QTL controlling um, that particular trait. So I phenotyped these in my population, rating them on a zero to nine scale. Um, I used the drop method. So basically I just dropped spikes from a set distance three times, and then I rated them on that scale. Uh, to get a, an idea of each type of shattering. Uh, so yeah, now with that in mind with shattering, I'm going to jump into genetic gain and talking about genetic gain in our populations. Um, so fluorite shattering was that first type of shattering, um, more or less. Whenever I look at both years of my data over across both locations, I'm seeing a general stepwise decrease. Uh, a lower number is a good thing, so a decrease is a good thing in shattering. Um, from cycle two to cycle five. Moving on to brittle rachis shattering, this is that other type of shattering um, caused by a different set of genes. Um, there's a little bit more noise, I guess you could call it, and it's not necessarily a stepwise decrease, but um, you can definitely see in cycle five that there's a higher frequency of individuals with a lower brittle rachis shattering score. So we're still seeing um, a decline in the number of individuals who have a high um, a higher score for shattering, which is not ideal. And then whenever I combined both of these types of shattering into the same score uh, and visualize them here, um, we can see that both that shattering overall is definitely decreasing from cycle two to cycle five, um, which is a good thing. So translating 
this into uh, genetic gain. Um, I calculated ge genetic gain or realized genetic gain um, by finding this the slope of the, of the regression line of the means on cycle number. So basically, each of these individual dots on here, um, that's the average for that cycle across each um, year location combination. Again, a decrease, a general decrease is a good thing for shattering. Um, and I saw genetic gain ranging anywhere from 6% to 22%. So what this means is that we're making progress. <laughs> Um, with this, this trend, um, we could see shattering population means near zero as soon as cycle 13. Again, remember, this isn't necessarily, this is a mean of the population. That doesn't mean that we won't see, um, and we haven't already seen individuals that um, are basically completely um, resistant to shattering already in our populations. So, so exciting stuff. <laughs> um, and then I'll just briefly touch on some other things that I'm doing as a part of my PhD work. Um, using this same data set, this parent common gardens data set, if you will, um, I'll be doing a genome-wide association study to associate um, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms or just differences in the genome with these domestication traits of interest. So shattering, like, like I talked about, free threshing grain, seed size, things like that. With this knowledge, we'll look at regions of the genome that might be um, harboring some of these QTL that are responsible for these traits. Um, this information can then be applied to the genomic selection models that Verbeen's working on. Um, and I'll also be able to look into some of, uh, comparing some of these regions of the genome QTL to other domesticated species. Um, the last thing, I'm also working on Kernza educational modules. So I'm working with the uh, Kernza CAP EEP team to um, translate some of our work into digestible um, modules that high school ag teachers and um, college level biology teachers can translate basic biological principles within the context of um, intermediate wheatgrass breeding. So uh, introducing some of these perennial cropping systems into, um, into curriculum that's already existing to allow for teachers to um, teach, <laughs> teach general biological concepts um, within a different framework. That's all I have, and I'll hand it back over to Praveen to continue. So you're you're sprouting um, yeah. uh, work. Have farmers reported sprouting in swaths? I think so, because Jake Younger is if he's on the call. I think he can probably talk more on this, but he's the one who sent me a picture of PHS that I think was sent to him from a grower. So yeah. that was kind of the yeah. when I when I grew the first big planting was Lee out of Rose Module, 35, 40 acres. It was a year where we swapped and uh, the heads were in the swap for damn near three weeks mm -hmm. under high moisture conditions. I don't remember seeing any sprout sprouting. So I was just wondering that it, it was starting to show up uh, yeah. in various places where they were swapping. I guess um, probably in our hand, are you seeing any? Um, relationship between shattering, forest shattering, and threshability, free threshing ability? Is there any relationship? I don't think so. I guess uh, I, will... I can jump in on that one. Yeah, they're, they're strongly negatively correlated or correlated the right way, at least in my populations. Um, so free threshing goes along with shatter resistance. It's two of the most highly correlated traits I have, I've seen. I don't know if you, you see the same thing in Minnesota. No, yeah, I was gonna say in my I see very low negative correlation, so not not, not a whole lot of strong. Um, by the way, it's like minus point one, sometimes plus point oh eight, but pretty low. Could there be a difference in the environment in which the, the evaluations are being done? It might be a difference in the threshing equipment we use, um, for one thing. Yeah. I, I try to thresh in such a way that I get maximum uh, left in the hull, so I get a good spread in the population. So um, that I, if they shatter at all, 
then you end up with uh, the seed shattering out in the hulls instead of being threshed out. So this results in selecting for ones that hold on uh, more tightly to the rachis. Um, I'll just say it, Hannah's pre-harvest sprouting data is a little concerning to me that you know every everything is fully sprouted after seven days because mm -hmm. with, with spring we we let it go seven days and then we see big differences. Some stuff isn't sprouted at all. Only the worst of the worst are really sprouting hot after seven days. So it, it sounds like wheatgrass is more like a bad white seeded wheat. Which is pretty susceptible to it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a trait that we need to definitely monitor and that may influence harvest methods mm -hmm. and timing. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't become an issue. There's there's probably things we can do reading wise to improve sprouting resistance, but it won't it won't be easy or fast. Mm -hmm. Jim, so so for for planting, I always uh, give seven days of cold treatment of the seed to break the dormancy. If I don't do that, um, some plants will produce seed that'll germinate really well in the first, uh, you know, the first three days with no cold treatment. Others will get almost zero germination without a cold treatment. So uh, there's a lot of genetic variability, at least at that level, for uh, needing that cold treatment. Uh, yeah. In terms of in the field, I've had like one year where it rained for about two weeks straight, or I had uh, sprouting in the head, but of course it's a pretty dry environment here, but I've seen it one time where, where it got kind of severe. It would be interesting to go back and uh, look at that cycle of selection that I grew out, we grew out at Rosemont. Um, you know, the seed that went to uh, Patagonia and to, to, to Rosa and compare yep. that cycle to some of the new material to see if you're breeding in the wrong damn direction. <laughs> well, so I'm curious if you guys, uh, do you always cold treat your seed before you're germinating it? Never, we actually harvest the same year, dry for three days, thresh, and we'll post the field in about a week and a half, two weeks. Yeah, so, so you, you could be selecting for plants or seeds yeah. that germinate without the cold treatment then. Uh, without intending to that's one of the reasons i always do the cold treatment because i don't want don't want to lose it yeah that, that, that's a tricky thing about production in minnesota is the, the time between harvest and planting could be two weeks four weeks at the most so we can't we can't have too much seed to our but we, we right to get the crop off baby so that's it's real it's going to be a, a needle to thread i think so i've never I had the trouble with dormancy in the field, but um, if you do it in the greenhouse, then they won't come up uh, without the cold treatment. Yeah, if, even in the greenhouse, we, we we almost never do cold treatment. I've had issues with dehauled grain, but I think for you and I have discussed the that's probably because the seeds are getting knocked around in the pressure and the, the germ is destroyed. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, cold treatment wise, we've, we've never done it. Maybe. In cycle one and two, we remember. Yeah. What's the minimum cold treatment you can need? So, yeah, so I put them in uh, moist, uh, wet conditions, uh, cold conditions for seven days. And that pretty much 100% of the genotypes will, will germinate that way. If you were just to harvest seed and bulk it together and, and then plant it, you'd say, oh, I got 50% germ without cold treatment. Um, but you got the ones that didn't need it, so you'd be selecting for those. Yeah, it, it, Jim's right that a week here might be if you too precious to lose. Maybe. Um, we move on to some. You can always harvest those and put them into a salad or something. Well, <laughs> 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 The, the field conditions does uh, do a good job of eliminating the dormancy. What's going on in here? Yeah, I, I'd say the past three, three, four years, we have planted probably by the end of August. It hasn't reached September. The, the, the southwestern location we have, 
September two or three, but overall we we try to get it done by the end of August. Um, there's a good amount of time for the seedlings to establish as they go into the winter. All right, I, I want to spend the next few minutes talking about perennial cereal rye, not cereal, not perennial rye grass. This is our regular rye, just perennialized. It's a novel crop and uh, it was actually developed in the 60s, so very novel um, in Germany. So the regular winter rye, Sicali cereali, was crossed with Sicali montanum, a perennial rye. Um, the figures you can see on the right the, at the bottom is Montanum, very weak looking type. Uh, Where's Montanum native to? I do not know that. Montanum? I, I don't know. Oh, you're so clever. Hey, it's in the name, right? <laughs> but um, it's um, then it was so the, the F1 were back crossed to Secali Cereali to select for perenniality, large seed, reduced shattering. Although I do see a lot of shattering, and on that I, I do have um, something to discuss with the group and, and higher grain yield. It has excellent dual use potential, just like Kernza. Uh, it has super high biomass. Um, the grain can be used for food and feed, but obviously rye is used mostly for feed, so probably most use is going to go towards that area. Um, it does offer ecosystem services according to papers that have been published in increasing soil organic matter, overall soil health, and of course, reducing soil erosion. Um, now, compared to current that, we don't know anything because it's a new crop, but um, it, it seems to offer the same services that regular winter rye does. Genome is highly similar to Cereali because, again, it was back crossed to it. Um, some, there's some donor segments from um, Montanum. There are, are stable diploid and tetraploid populations, and I evaluated both side by side. I, I could not tell the difference in the field. They look similar to me. Um, but there's there's two X and four X that are that are stable. Um, it's primarily outcrosser, but it could also sell uh, rye. To my knowledge, it, it sells a little to F three F four or S three F S four. Um, but to what degree in, in perennial rye? I don't know. We need to test this, and maybe some some um, winter greenhouse experiment can be initiated to test this out. Now, as for breeding and evaluation goals, we planted 620 plants uh, in 2020 fall, and I obtained the material from a breeder in Canada, and the population was divided as uh, 400 diploids, 99 tetraploids, one died, I did not pick 99, um, <laughs> and there were 121 Sicali strictum accessions from core collection in Idaho. They did not have Sicali mentanum at that time. They could now, I can check. Um, and Sicali strictum is also perennial, but that was not the one used to make uh, perennial cereal rye. I just wanted to see what another perennial rye looks like uh, alongside these more developed perennial ryes. The nursery design was identical to our wheatgrass, where we did space plants three feet apart and give some nitrogen uh, in, in the spring of both years. Here's what they look about. I think two weeks, two and a half weeks after transplanting in, in 2020 fall, um, opposite Bell Museum. If the, if the field hasn't been destroyed, they should still be there in some form like this coming summer. Um, another picture of the layout from a different angle. There's three feet between um, the plants and the growth was highly vigorous uh, compared to wheatgrass, which which takes well into the next spring to show its vigor, whereas the rye was uh, showing its vigor the same fall. And I have one picture that, that compares them um, next to each other. Here's what they look like early spring. Um, this was end of April, maybe early May, first week of May, when I was taking vigor data on wheatgrass and they, they look nice, they look very nice. Uh, here is the picture that compares wheatgrass and rye. So on this side uh, of the screen, under the red line is perennial rye. And on, on the top of the screen above the red line is wheatgrass, except that little rectangle in blue. That's also perennial rye. We have some empty space there. So you can kind of see the difference in, in how, uh, how vigorously rye grows in year one compared to wheatgrass in year one. Uh, there's a lot more empty space uh, on, on wheatgrass portion 
um, compared to Rai. But there were some few wheatgrass genotypes that grew just as well, but the, the, the number of those were very few. And overall, Rai had uh, a stronger growth in, in the spring, which makes sense. This has to you know, senesce and, and, and do everything it does by mid, mid July. So um, just how the plant is, is wired. That field is really clean. Do you want to use herbicide? herbicide? Well, thank you. Uh, Brett, you're on the line. Uh, that's where you're doing a great job. Um, <laughs> we, we, do, we do spray some, but uh, once, and we, we go through a, a multivator very early in the spring. And after that, it's uh, pretty much manual weeding. I, was gonna say, I think that, that's the field I had my bidding press in. I'm just wondering if that's the question. <laughs> Possible, but yeah, we, we Brett takes pride in his work, so uh, mm -hmm. feels pretty good most of the time. One difference in genotypes there's this is two, these are two spaced plants next to each other, they're both um diploids, for, uh, if I remember right. Um, I'm just showing you the difference in in, in the plant um, type. So, both, both of those came from single seed. Both of them came from one single seedling. You yes. probably got at least 60 seed bearing spikes on both of them. Uh, there's easily yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, 100 yeah. plus, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's massive tiller. Um, if we we're comparing biomass with wheatgrass, like it, it, it blows wheatgrass out of the water. And I'm comparing wheatgrass because I work on it. Nothing against wheatgrass, I love the crop. But just saying, at least for biomass, I was really surprised how, how well this did. Um, coming out in the spring. Maybe you guys need that trade in your wheat. Yeah. Here I go. Now, unlike wheatgrass, there's uh, leaf rust in rye. So these are just challenges um, in the field in terms of phenotyping or what we see. Uh, there's leaf rust, not much stem rust. We don't get much stem rust here up here, but I did see some pustules uh, a little late in the season, but nothing uh, too detrimental as, as the leaf rust was. Um, and on the, the figure on the right just shows uh, was there variation much? Oh, indeed, I I, I took data. It, it's yeah. segregating for these trees quite nicely. Yeah. This is twenty twenty one. This is twenty twenty one summer. I plucked some leaves and gave to Jim Palmer. That was one, Jim. Well, I'm trying to think if we saw any leaf rust on our winter wheat in twenty twenty one because it was so hot. Right. Mm -hmm. Spring we did not. Nothing. And maybe the timing was right for this crop for them to latch on. This is ergot, uh, pretty big. Um, in wheatgrass, it's very small compared to this. Uh, in hybrid dry, I've seen twice as this size. Um, so they, they can get pretty, pretty gnarly. And just one more picture during, I think, a day or two before harvest in St. Paul. The crop looks, looks fantastic. Now onto major challenges, and there's there's quite a few, but there's two I'm, I'm kind of. What's the yield base? What's the projected we, we yield base from your work or from the Canadians? I'd have to get back to you on that, but I think the paper said somewhere about about half of the regular winter rise. There's there's a lot of room to improve. Seed size is maybe two thirds of regular winter rye. Um, so. And being a perennial, there are challenges. It's not quite. No, but I mean, it's not really, really low. No, it is. Yeah. It's already much better given that all the parents, well, except in Canada, but the, the domestication percentage, yeah. I would say, was higher uh, in this than other crop like wheatgrass, for example. So the biggest challenge I'm facing is um, there's uh, a, a, a crazy amount of shattering followed by a crazier amount of volunteer growth. In wheatgrass, folks who work on it in the field know that. There is shattering, the seeds germinate, but they just stay as you know small seedlings and they're not, they're not, a, they don't pose any challenge to the mother crop. On this one, shattered seed would establish and outcompete the mother plant. And if you go next summer, you will not be able to tell which one's your mother plant unless you have it somehow. Mm -hmm. And coming from woodgrass, I did not do that, learned the hard way. Um, and I could not tell the mother plant apart in summer 2022. Um, again, a learning lesson, but we, we would try uh, pre emerge herbicide. It can, it, in our experience, could not reach all the seed down with maybe just a greasy, you know, spread whole time. I have to also get back to you on that. I don't know the name exactly. Um, we, we, we tried whatever we use for wheatgrass, 
that was not able to kill or minimize maybe the was timing. Maybe they get it on soon enough. Um, year one, that could be possible. Last fall, um, uh, Jake's Dr. Jake Younger's technician Jesse sprayed uh, a really uh, generous amount of uh, herbicide uh, or pre-emerge, according to you know his words, and uh, we we saw we saw some growth not long after. Soon after. <clears throat> Harvest. The same day of harvest, I see. it was was actually the the straw was um, removed using some some uh, instrument and then sprayed. Yeah, it's much better there. Uh, <laughs> Jesse was very excited about this work and he did the best he could, and, and yet we saw some volunteers. And that's that, in my experience, almost game over. You cannot tell them how the plant is hard. The volunteers are the shattered green and not source. Um, great point. Um, in in my if if what I saw was true, then yes, it's mostly the volunteer um, plant. Um, but it, it it could be tillers. We need some agronomists and soil scientists involved in this yeah. now too. And I was walking around there. This was probably August or early September, twenty twenty one. It looked all dead to me. Yeah, I could not find a mother plant with any like. To it, they looked all dead. There's about, I think, about 60 to 70 percent had just died. And unless the roots were alive, and like Jess is saying, they grew out in a different way. Well, that's an enjoyable There was a, yeah, there was a student some years ago who tried to look at this, and it was a much older cycle, though. So I don't necessarily judge her results, but she saw, she felt like she saw that it was mostly tillers that were coming back and filling in. Tillers um, or seedlings. Tillers from the mother. I understand, but but not the seed, shattered seed. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know how robust her data was. The shattering in in perennial rye right now is worse than than it was in in wheatgrass when we started in two thousand eleven. In my observation, it it's, it goes everywhere. Um, it's pretty bad. So for a breeder, I can I can see that, that this could be a problem with the whether it's a, a seedling or whether it's a volunteer or tillers and so forth. But for a producer, for, Great what's, what would be the issue there? Probably not much because if if some seeds get dropped and it comes out just as fine, then maybe it's not a problem. But uh, yeah, as as a, as a breeder, as a scientist, I want to make sure that if I'm selling something as a perennial, I want to be you know it to be hundred percent perennial. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't, we, we don't know if the yield goes down in year two or goes up for that matter from these volunteers. Mm -hmm. What happens in year three, we don't, we don't know. Um, we've, we've had the plant in the field for just two seasons and this will be third season if uh, we decide to keep the field in the spring. So very new crop for us as well in terms of data generation. Seems like it might be a problem on termination. If it's um, shattering and then you see in the field, and um, then you're trying to rotate to a different crop or something, that it may come back. Um, and also, I was wondering just about the competition between the, the shattered seedlings and the mother, and if that would then possibly reduce yields. But... Yeah, because it was hard to, to say. We then, yeah. But, well, one approach could be, and I was talking this in our lab meeting. Um, sell them in, in the greenhouse up to F3, F4, and take those rows to the field. Uh, maybe add more spacing, do, do, do something with it, like agronomically. Because um, I guess there'll be a little more self, more inbreds. And, uh, Are these diploids or the tetraploids? It happens in all. I have, I have mostly diploids um, and some tetraploids, but that was a real wide issue. If you have the, the diploids, of course, you don't need. This beauty of the stuff is now with your variation you need. Yeah. But that's one avenue of research. We um we just got a, a you know one round of funding from Forever Green and MDA. So uh, I think I think we can definitely explore some um, some approaches in the in the future. Um, so why haven't other institutions? invested huge amounts of resources into the development of this crop. Did the, are the Canadians aggressively invested in this 
species? Not anymore. They were until the breeder who gave me the seed, he now moved on to legumes up in, uh, in, in Canada. And then the, his successor is more interested in genetics and less breeding from, uh, from you know, my, my meetings with him. Um, as for why others aren't, I mean, it's a new, new crop. Um, Hard to say resources are not sixties, you said or... it was so it was first crops in the sixties, but not as it did not become as widespread until the late nineties. That's so mid-90s and onwards is when you see more papers being published. Yeah. Um, and even then it's only from a few selected groups. So who's working on it in the world? Canada? Who else in the United States? They're looking at them. <laughs> Europe. <laughs> With uh although New York, Matt Ryan and and, and Jake. Um, they had some agronomic trials, I believe, not too long ago, but breeding, selection, and, and improvement, uh, there's, to my knowledge, not another uh, program, except in Canada. I see Jake has his hand up. I don't know how long it's been up there, Jake, oh, but sorry, go Jake. ahead and jump in if you want to. Sure. Mm -hmm. I Just sure. Uh, uh, build on what Prabeen said is a lot of the germplasm came out of the Lethbridge research site in Canada, and then there was a uh, a lapse, I think, in research during the transition when um, the breeder there left. And that was right at a time when there was a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about uh, what was coming out of the program. And as Praveen mentioned, Cornell, Ohio State, uh, University of Minnesota, um, and others, TLI, um, there were plans to do some trials. And one grant was funded, but that also happened right in 2019, 2020, and because of limitations of what we could do in the field, more of the resources were allocated to the intermediate wheatgrass and not the perennial rye. So um, yeah, there's still a lot of excitement, I think, around the, the idea of this, but just things haven't fallen into place to make it happen. Yeah, and just when I see other hands up, but I was, you know, now you made my comment a minute ago, I was like knee jerking back to Kernza also. So yeah, I think you're right that uh, someone needs to like dig up some of these plants and look at how much it really is tillering or not. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, that might be a good step to be some eager undergrad with a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> or Don. Or Don. Don's around. Don's been looking for life for the next summer, so yeah. <laughs> I think if we if we were to invest even half the resources less than that of what we've done in terms, I think I, I do think this crop has a quite a bit of potential in biomass and in feed industry. I know they're making whiskey and whatnot out of it, but Lee, you also have your hand up. Right, right. Yeah, to kind of address okay. what Don was saying uh, or asking mm -hmm. why, why hasn't it taken off. Um, Everyone I know who's tried it has had a similar experience to what you have, um, extreme shattering, very low second year survival. Um, I worked with it for three or four years, and um, it was it was very hard to work with because of the extreme shattering, um, and then most of the plants dying as well. Uh, the, the genetics of it, at least the tetraploid, there's a series of translocations between the, the two species uh, used to make the perennial cereal rye, which results in inherent uh, large levels of sterility, and that sterility results in inherently high levels of ergot. So it's been uh, difficult to get around that. Uh, in Canada, where they've been using it primarily for grazing um, as a perennial, but you know, primarily for grazing, uh, it you know, has some possibilities. People who have, have grown it, um, you, know, you can sort out the ergot, but farmers are just kind of appalled at a whole field full of ergot. Um, so that, there's been kind of some <laughs> things that have been hard hard kind of strikes against it. Um, I think they can all be solved eventually, but uh, if I were gonna do it, I'd probably stick with a diploid level to try to get away from that and kind of back across to the Montana and try to get shatter resistance out of annual rye into Montana and kind of go from there. Um, that's that's where I would uh, approach it. Yeah, no, that's a great point on the diploids. Uh, the reason why I had that in the largest proportion was because when I got seed from Jamie, he said diploid is the best one so far. So go with that, but I'm also giving you tetraploid. So I, I planned it for evaluation's sake, but the focus, yeah, would be on deployed going forward if, um, if this is sustainable. We'll see. What percentage of yours survive after two years? 
Oh, um, the mother plants? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not so, much. Like, are they a biennial? <laughs> is it more, more like biennial rye and perennial rye at this point? Even just after one year, the plant could be 100% senesce. As you're going to cut with a rice knife, the plant would just come off the ground. So that's again going back to you know what Jess said. Unless it's alive under the soil and doing fine. Well, that's what we're trying change. to figure out. So the, the core, the ground dies, but it has tillers that live, right? Yeah. So that is a perennial. That's a perennial. Yeah. You know, parts of it die, mm -hmm. right? And leaves. It's kind of like Jerusalem artichoke. <clears throat> well, <right>? like, <laughs> well, I think that isn't that the story with the perennial sorghum down in Kansas? Isn't it the sorghum down there that it's mostly surviving through tillers that last? No, years? the sorghum survives through rhizomes. Where uh, rhizomes, the, sorry, the perennial yeah. rye doesn't have any rhizomes, and yeah. when it looks dead, it's it's usually truly dead. Uh, okay. I, I don't see it coming back. Usually, it's good to know. One one thought on the sterility issues just reminds me of what Kevin Betts has done with the perennial sunflowers. A lot of self sterility, and he just self and self and self until he found stuff that would cross that would self and make you know viable seed. So, could be a model to follow there. Yeah, my my experience with hybrid dry tells me that up to up to S four S five there will be some. Um, depression, but they, they, they it will sell for, for a good number of generations. Just to back you up, you know, it's always good to take advice and plant breeding from a weed scientist. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm just going to end with um, some mostly pictures on perennial poultry evaluation in Minnesota. It's um, not reading it, just looking at what the it other things I give a damn about you. Yeah, I know. That's, it's in the answer. It's the whole time. <laughs> This species is a Avena macrostacea. It's native to Algerian mountains, uh, from what I know. Uh, seed size is about a third of regular oak, maybe even smaller. You can see in the picture. Um, characteristics, <laughs> characteristics largely unknown. Um, not, not much has been done to properly characterize the morphology and other properties of this crop. That seed uh, in that picture was. Uh, Given to me by this gentleman, a farmer in, in Indiana. He grew some, he grew some and he said he had eight grams harvested and he sent me five grams, um, just, just like that. So very nice of him. From that, I planted about 250 plants in St. Paul last fall. Um, I'm also in the process of getting diverse grain from a scientist in Algeria. The university office is drafting the MGA and then we'll, it should be here definitely by the spring or summer. So this is what we did. We, we grew them in uh, peat pots, ready to go in the field. Uh, this is after 10 days, uh, 12 days, perhaps. They grow quite fast as well. Um, and then we, here we go. We transplanted in the field, I think it's larger picture, there we go, um, with um, non-paid volunteer help from Hannah, Brett, and other undergrads. So really thankful for all of your uh, help that day. Um, we we grew north to south, right next to wood grass, in between the space plants and, and the variety trials. Uh, north of Fort Center. On the left is a few days after um, transplanting in the field. They look pretty good. Um, I think one plant died of transplant shock, from what I could tell. Otherwise, they were doing excellent. On the right, um, ten days, twelve days after um, transplanting. You can see some of them are trying to boot, and the problem got a little, little out of hand. This is just a closer picture. There's one, um, one tiller I can show you right, right here that's um, about to emerge with uh, some, some, you know, spike on its end. And this was one plant. There were dozens of plants like this that, within a month, month and a half of transplanting. They went from that four leaf, five leaf stage to spikes, and that was unreal. This plant and those other 50 plants who did the same would probably die uh, or not. I would we, have to see what happened this, this summer. We've had an excellent winter in terms of both coldness and the volume of snow. So they're getting snow cover as well as the, the, the temperature. Uh, but out of 250 plants, if 50 make it, 100 make it. I, I consider that 
not too bad for year one. And um, with additional grain coming from Algeria, uh, we, we plan them side by side and, and keep this going for another year. So to summarize, we'll see how many survive and how many are truly perennials uh, after year two. Um, we plant more material from Algeria this fall and I'm considering crossing this regular oat and select for perennialty and everything. But um, again, this project is also, um, it just started depending on how the plants do in the field, but it will determine my levels of interest. But uh, some 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 new 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 crop for a Minnesota landscape, and the main benefit uh, of this crop would be that it would um, be a true perennial cover crop given its height, which is very short. Uh, it should grow up very fast in the spring, um, from what I've been told by well, by the farmer in Indiana. Of course, I haven't seen it myself firsthand. So th this spring we'll, we'll collect a good amount of data and we go from there. It's a reason the joke I said. I ran into this plant in Morocco in a greenhouse, and I've been trying to get that material here for about 20 years. And um, it got materials out of the gene bank. And, and what was the geneticist, the USDA geneticist that worked on oak? Howard Rines. Howard Rines. Hi. Howard Rines got some of that seed grew it in his garden in Shoreview, and it did in fact overwinter. But the materials that he could always get his hands on was all the same genetic background, and he couldn't make crosses, right? So the whole issue was getting enough genetic variation here. Uh, so he had, a, had a, a base to develop a, a, a breeding program to make some, some of these new crosses. So this has only taken 20 years, so. <laughs> I emailed uh, Howard. I haven't heard back. Maybe Don, we should drop by his house and see. And get some seat from it. Well, um, I, I, as I said many, many times, it would be great to, to to have a sit down with Howard. I don't know how his health is, and the others do here, but uh, he's no longer in his home for as my neighbor, so he's in another facility. And so I'll I'll do some due diligence to see him. But you know, all of us in the room that knew him, I mean, he was a guy, I mean, and, and all the genetics and with his partnership with Ron Phillips all those years. So the last comment I make is, you know, in, in addition to trying to develop another perennial crop, there's the, the benefit also of taking genes from this species to the common oats, regular oats for disease resistance or um, maybe I don't know, hodging resistance, if that's an issue. I don't know what the issues are, but the sharing of, of genes can always help out the crops. Yeah. It may be more trouble than work. You know, I, know, I just remember walking down that hall in the research facility in Morocco, and there was this big pot of big oak looking plants. And what was that? And what was that? And I tried to track it. And so. So with that, thank you all for your attention. I'm going to end with the acknowledgement slide. Uh, a, a, a big thanks to our funding partners, MDA, Forty Green Institute, um, USD NEPA that supports some of our um, uh, current breeding efforts, FFAR, and all of our collaborators, colleagues, friends, and undergrads. And I'm sure I've missed a lot of names on the slide, but thanks, thanks everyone. Are you guys hopeful that you're going to be able to get the yields up to make this crop commercial in 10 years? Which crop are you talking about? Well, you know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 I so, would. So, so, is there a strategy group of the geneticists and breeders that's thinking about how to make that big step? You know, I know Lee has put a program together to do to, to two cycles a year. Or is attempting to do that, right? Yes. You're up to one now, right? Is that the solution to to the to the problem? Is is this more cycles, or are there other things that ought to be looked at, or are in fact being looked at? That's one approach. I would not call that the only solution. That's one approach to look at it. I mean, yeah. There's you know possibly other avenues. Also, like we you and I have talked about it. You know, with mutation work. He has looked at mutation population, and I, I don't think the outcome was that positive. Be, but and no, that's not the that's not the only only solution. There's, you know, you can you can try to cross 
um, with wheat and, and maybe bring a large seed or high yield from that crop. There's, it's, but I agree, there's got to be a consortium, like a, a panel of people who yeah. think what gets the best. Could you give us an update? And this is something we should have done uh, in previous years is to maintain an update on the crosses uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, intermediate with, with wheat or dirt, right? We now have some populations here on campus. What is the general thought in the group about the development of perennial wheat? What's the status of that work? I am not as deeply involved into it as, as I, I want to be, um, but I see Lee's hand up and maybe he's the guy who can answer both questions. Lee, I'm gonna- Yeah, Lee, could you give us a few words? Yeah, Don, it's not a short answer, but um, yeah, definitely. We've moved to the, the direction of Durham by intermedium doubled uh, lines and um, getting stability in those has been possible. So they're now pretty uh, stable lines. We still have issues with uh, entering a spring regrowth pattern where they want to make heads after you harvest them in the summer. Um, I think that ultimately, uh, we're looking at different avenues, mutagenesis, um, and also targeted mutations through genome editing. Um, I think some of those tools are going to have to be used to solve that problem. We have to, to address particular genes to, to make that work, but I, I think it's quite feasible to get there um, with editing some of those, but also with the question of what to do about intermedium, um, there's pretty good potential for some breakthroughs with genome editing of intermedium as well. Um, we've got a good program going on in Denmark right now. They've edited a large number of genes uh, successfully. The plants don't have phenotypes yet. They're, they're still growing up, but the, the editing process was doable much easier and quicker than I thought it was going to be uh, for, for numerous genes. They will even have one plant with three different genes uh, edited. So um, knowing some of these critical domestication genes, hopefully they have a heart, high impact. Um, so far in the breeding, it's been frustrating to find any uh, high impact genes. Most of them account yeah. for 2% of the variation or less. Uh, yeah. But perhaps if you edit all six copies, uh, you might have a high impact. So uh, it's, it might just be that you know, the level of diversity and the fact that you have a, a hexaploid species that's standing in your way of, of major effect genes. And we'll so see pretty soon. How that edit, go. So it's now possible to edit six or eight at a time? Yeah, so if you put in what it's possible to have to design your, you know, your editing gene or your editing uh, molecule properly, you can end up with, uh, it's gonna target all six copies. So in some cases, you might have to design a second one if the, the alleles are too different at the different low side. But um, yeah, it, it's possible to, to get all of them to go at one shot. Yeah, I looked at the plants uh, that uh, I think Jake has here on campus, the perennial wheat, and there were some lines after harvest uh, that tried to send up new, new shoots, but we were also uh, looking at the growth in the desert, <laughs> but uh, there was a range in, in regrowth, uh, and some of, the, some of them look really good, even with that heavy, heavy drought, so it's going to be interesting to see how they perform, some of those lines perform here. Yeah, we've definitely got plants that make it through multiple years here, and it's often extremely hot and dry after harvest here. Um, so I would expect if the winter doesn't kill them, you'll be okay. Cool. Just the last comment, I should have mentioned this in the uh, announcements. Probably most of you saw the email I sent out yesterday about our legislative updates, lots of good stuff going on. Um, I think given the time, we should talk in more depth next week, yeah. um, but we'll, we'll take some time at the beginning of next week and do an update and yeah, just keep people in the loop and just to reiterate.